of the CIA Operators Initiative um, for 2019-2020. Looks like we have a great lineup of talks uh, from you know, September to what, April or May. Um, we have a lot to talk about this evening, and so, and also we have a lot to do in the immediate future. And what I'm going to do is start off with some uh, observations, some of it negative, but also end on some hopeful considerations for us so that we can better reach out to youth, turn things around, and, and move forward. And so why don't we begin with a prayer and ask for God's help. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, as God, you took on human nature and entered into our world to do life with us, to dream with us, to suffer with us. This so that we can live life to the full here on earth with the confident hope of enjoying eternal life with you in heaven. Help, help us to imitate you, Lord, and to enter into the world of others, especially young people, to do life with them, to dream with them, to suffer with them, this so that they can experience your love, your truth, and your power as we have. In Jesus' name we pray. St. Francis Xavier, pray for us. live Jesus in our hearts. Forever. I asked my daughters to see if I got that right. They go to a school here. So. Um, a fair question to ask is, why am I giving this talk? Um, I'm the director of parish evangelization, and I don't have direct ministry in young adult ministry. However, um, I do uh, oversee and have adult confirmation classes and most of them are young adults. And some of those, um, you know, some of the insights that I've been getting in the recent, uh, I would say the last couple of seasons I wanted to share with you tonight. I also taught high school for uh, six years, uh, different religious classes uh, in Washington, D.C., in Chicago. I also used to work at Relevant Radio. Uh, most importantly, I have six kids, as Ann said. Uh, they range from 22 down to 5. And I can tell you that although they're off to a good start, uh, discipleship is, is hard work. It really requires awareness, intentionality, and also a lot of prayer. So, as a director of uh, parish evangelization, I serve about 157 parishes in 16 counties. And out of those 157, we have about 20 that are showing some signs of growth, 50 that have plateaued or leveled off, and about 87 that are in decline, okay? So in order to turn things around, we have to make a few adjustments, and you can be a big help in doing this. Uh, I want to refer three main sources that we're going to use today. One is called Reviving Evangelism. And this was a collaborative effort between the Barner Group and Alpha USA. They did a study on practicing Christians, non-Christians, lapsed Christians, they call it, and also the different generations like millennials, Gen Z, etc. Um, and I would say the main takeaway from this book, and I really believe that every parish should have a copy of this, is that practicing Christians have just as many misconceptions of non-Christians as they have of us, okay? And one of the things that we have to do is really try to cross that divide and make a self-assessment as to the things that we can do to connect with them. Another book that was recently uh, released is The New Copernicans by David Steele, Millennials and the Survival of the Church. We're gonna be drawing from his observations. I think it's a great book. And he's offered a lot of insights with that. And thirdly, the last resource is a very sh a relatively short article. Uh, it's the Barna article, What Will It Take to Disciple the Next Generation? This was released, I think, about two or three years ago, and they offer uh, some great insights. So I want to start off with a quote from the New Copernicans by David Seal. And he says that millennials make up 23% of the U.S. population. And there's only, we're talking evangelical churches and Catholic parishes, less than 10% of churches reflect that percentage. In other words, uh, over 90% young adults are underrepresented in these churches. 
And this is a great quote. It was sobering for me. It helped me to really um, make an assessment and go forward with determination in reaching out to young adults. And he says this, churches thrive for a number of reasons, but they close for one reason, a failure to reach the next generation. We are currently perfectly aligned to the results we are getting. If we want to get something different, we have to think something different and do something different. We'll need to experiment, even if that means trying over and over again, rather than ignoring the issue and continuing as we have. So for today, in order to think something different, to do something different, I just wanted to briefly talk about, just briefly, the rapid changes in culture, the rapid changes in youth, and how it affects how youth receive that. Okay, there is a saying that, uh, that a mentor of mine told me, and he says, if the, the ground and the map disagree, the ground always wins. And we have to make those adaptations relatively uh, quickly. And so I wanted to provide an illustration, a contrast between two movie providers, Blockbuster and Netflix, and some of the lessons that parishes can uh, take away from this. Uh, one of these movie providers embraced a big idea to take the products, okay, right to the people, in, in fact, into the homes of families. Uh, the other one continued to expect consumers to come to them, all right? And this was a, uh, a costly mistake. As of August of 2019, there's only one blockbuster store left in the world, and that's in Oregon. That's in Bend, Oregon. And some of you know that uh, Blockbuster was founded in 1985. It expanded considerably in the 1990s. But in the early 2000s, it started to decline. Okay? And it eventually filed bankruptcy in 2010. And in fact, that's about the year that the Blockbuster near my house in Appleton, I think, closed. And so they had to file for bankruptcy, and, and that was pretty much the beginning of the end for Blockbuster. On the other hand, Netflix was founded in 1997. And I don't know this for sure, but I, I once heard that they tried to uh, partner up with uh, Blockbuster, but Blockbuster didn't want to do it. And so Netflix found a way with the digital communication and this way uh, to uh, get the movie rentals into the homes, and as a result, Netflix has over 150 million subscriptions worldwide. And one of the lessons that we can take away from this, if someone 100 years from now looked back and read about the decline of Blockbuster and came to the conclusion that the demand for movie rentals had also declined, they would be wrong. It was just that Netflix found a way to do a, a, a better job of getting the product to the consumers. Uh, that same person, 100 years from now, they would look back to the year 1990, and they would know some, notice something with the number of parishes in the United States. In the United States, that is the year that the number of parishes peaked, and then it started to decline. And here is what I would argue from that observation. If that person, 100 years from now, were to conclude, because of the decline of our parishes, and since 1990, by the way, I think we've closed nearly about 4,000 in the U.S., okay? And so, if that person were to conclude, from the decline of parishes, that the demand for faith in Jesus has also declined, that person, I think, would be wrong. And the observation um, I think, my observation, is that it has never been more in demand than it is today. People are really, especially young people, young adults, and millennials, are really sensing uh, a kind of emptiness in, in their lives, and we're gonna see that in some of the studies. However, we have to be on time, okay? So the saying in the military is this, it is better to be imperfectly prepared and on time and perfectly prepared and light. Blockbuster learned the hard way, and I'm praying that our parishes, not only in our diocese, but also throughout the nation, uh, will, will be on time. And so we're just gonna take a quick look at the rapid changes in, cult in culture. Excuse me. Sorry. 
love that. Okay. And here's what happened since 1980. One of the things I think we have to do is just to take a, a quick snapshot as to what happened since 1980 and the kind of changes that have profound effects on the way we live. The launching of the IBM personal desktop computer uh, was in 1980. Introduction of digital cable television, 1990. The growing of acceptance of hooking up, 1990s. The increased rate of cohabitation and the decreased rate of marriage uh, also happened in the 1990s. In 1991, we had the launch of the internet. School shootings uh, happened in 1999. The attack on the World Trade Center in 2001. The launch of the Facebook, 2004. And the first iPhone in 2007. And of course, in 2015, we had the legalization of same-sex marriage. And so from these, these changes, we've had a change, a, a dramatic change in how we communicate with one another, in the values and the boundaries of relationships, but also the feelings of insecurity. And today, I uh, went to pick up my daughter at one of the schools here in Appleton, and of course, you have to be buzzed in. And just a few years ago, that wasn't necessary, but the security, the way we live, has, has really changed in the last 30 years or so. On a local level, our neighborhoods have changed. The dynamics, the way we communicate with our neighbors have uh, changed. I think it has something to do with cable television, maybe movie rentals, and uh, computers give us less incentive to go outside. Uh, in the 1970s, when I was growing up, I knew everybody in my neighborhood. I knew houses five down this way, uh, uh, my neighbors five houses down this way and five houses down that way. We pretty much knew um, just about every family. And more importantly, the adults in that neighborhood were my mentors in sports and so many other things. Um, and so the, our neighborhood has really changed, our neighborhoods, I should say, has really changed within the last 30 years. And so also the dynamics within households started to change in 2000s. Um, the, with the iPhone and social media, uh, the conversation between family members has been, uh, has been eclipsed to a certain extent. Family dinner, shared experiences with family, has decreased. And one of the things that the article, uh, What Will It Take to Disciple the Next Generation, really recommends is that parents, teachers, and church leaders talk about how, with the youth, how social media has affected them, some of the vulnerabilities, and also how to discern uh, worldviews. The underlying shift in our neighborhoods and our families has been from unorganized activities to an extent to organized activities. And because of the lack of relationships, interaction in our neighborhoods, we put an emphasis on organized sports. This is something that the Tramley family does. We're very much into that and also academics. And so this is reflected in uh, the priority of parents. Uh, studies will show, and this is really um, affecting faith formation on Wednesday nights at the parishes, for instance. Uh, studies will show that parents will go the extra mile and make the sacrifice, even if it means not eating dinner together, uh, to have their kids uh, excel in academics and also in sports. And I think that is a legitimate ideal, a legitimate priority. It's just that those two things alone will not equip um, our youth and young adults for good, healthy relationships. And so this big impact of these cultural rapid shifts has had a, a huge impact on youth. And also, one of the things that the New Copernicans books really reminds us is that the Millennials and Gen Z are not the cause of this, but they are the carriers of these changes. And by the way, just a quick definition in case that you don't know. Millennials are uh, young people in their uh, 20s and 30s, and Gen Z are adolescents going into their 20s. So those are some of the implications of our 
of our cultural, uh, of our culture. One of the things that I wanted to point out in our changes in view is that the parental priorities are reflected in what Gen Z and also millennials prioritize as well. Barna did a study and they asked members of the Gen Z generation as well as the millennials to rank 12 things in order, in, in accordance to what they think is important. So, some of those categories are financial independence, following my dreams, education, a career, getting married, becoming a parent, a spiritual maturity that is faith, okay? And both generations pretty much got it the same as far as the, the top three priorities for them is Finishing my education, 66% uh, ranked that as number one from Gen Z. Starting a career, 66%. Becoming financially independent, 65%. And it's a little different with millennials. Now, again, those priorities are quite legitimate because to become financially independent, to have a good career, is something that is needed in our life. What concerns me about this is that the relational categories did not make it into the top five, such as faith, getting married, parenting, and caring for the poor and needy. And what is noteworthy about this is that even though they feel like relationships are very important, they will default to what is familiar to them. This is one of the reasons why, if you grow up in a verbally or physically abusive household, uh, it's not uncommon that you will be attracted uh, to just that, even though you grew up hating the abuse, okay? It's a lot of people default to what they're familiar with. And so with this low priority on relationships, this is really important that to know that how much anxiety has increased among uh, the millennials and Gen Z. Barnes & Noble reported that their books on anxiety has increased by 30% from 2017 to 2018. Now, that really surprised me, and I went back and I talked to my 22-year-old daughter, my 20-year-old my son, and my 17-year-old daughter. I said, are your friends experiencing anxiety? And they said, absolutely. That is definitely the case. And the thing is that um, in a lot of your colleges, including the college that I went to, Franciscan University of Steubenville, they have a hotline just to kind of cope with stress because that's something that they haven't been equipped to do uh, from uh, the families they were raised in and also the institutions they attended. One of the things that I noticed with the young adults that I minister to is that more and more of them are, have therapists because they don't have mentors, okay? And this is something that is, has huge implications for our parishes. These um, having mentors for younger adults and getting them situated and aligned with people that can walk with them, not just with their spirituality, but also with their, with their life is really, really important. So the conclusion on, on this part of the talk is that there are fewer safe places to be vulnerable, you know, to, to share, you know, what is really bothering you and saying, I, I really need help. Uh, on Facebook, on Instagram, Snapchat, you have a lot of happy faces, you know, so I don't post pictures of me and my wife arguing or me, you know, getting on my kids or anything like that. They're all happy faces, even with my Facebook, all right? Now, although that's useful in making connections with people, it's just not real life and they need these safe places. I believe that our parishes can be those safe places and we can inspire families to create those safe places because suicide has gone up and like I said, anxiety too. And you're gonna see this reflected in the comparison of millennials and also the elder generation, uh, senior citizens, 65 and older, okay? So they ask them, if they experience emptiness. And the elders said only 14% strongly agree or agree somewhat, whereas millennials uh, agree or, or somewhat agree, strongly agree or somewhat agree, 47%. That is a huge jump in just a couple generations. 
Uh, they were also asked to, uh, to respond to, I often feel rejected. Again, a huge jump from uh, the elders to millennials, which is 44%. I think one of the reasons why we see this contrast is because uh, our culture has moved from the, a guilt and innocence culture to a shame and honor culture. And this is what reviving evangelism points out. What's the difference between the two? Reviving evangelism uh, states that a guilt and innocence culture, when you make a mistake, it's just that, a mistake, okay? In a shame and honor culture, when you make a mistake, you're the mistake. And that's a huge difference. You see the political climate, and you may have had, uh, you know, political disagreements with the family, and you may be even reluctant to share what your political views are out of fear that you may be written off. I'm, I'm seeing that more and more, okay? And so, a spiritual law that I think we need to recover is this. To love the sinner and hate the sin. If we're not doing both, it, we're going to get the opposite, okay? What you're seeing in culture right now is loving the sin and hating the sinner, all right? So, uh, loving the sinner and hating the sin is something that the Bible teaches us. It's something that our Catholic faith teaches us. So, what do these changes in culture and in youth mean for us as far as reaching out to young people? What does it mean for parents and teachers and catechists and priests when it comes to sharing the faith? One of the things that we're trying to make an adjustment at the diocese is to go from... Um, information dumping or primarily content sh sharing or teachings to uh, walking with young people and also even young adults, all right? I want to give you just a little aside as to how the church is trying to make the adjustments right now. In the 1970s, in the 1980s, and in the 1990s, there has been a real deficit of truth, poor catechesis, poor theological formation in our grade schools, in our high schools, and in our colleges. Now the church has rightly responded to that by beefing up content and resources. And so even at the Diocese of Green Bay, we have wonderful resources for the catechists, for um, theolog um, theology teachers at the high school level. But once we got that all situated, we turned around and we realized we have another problem. And that is when truth is absence or has been watered down a little bit, relationships suffer because of it, okay? And so right now we have a relationship deficit. And this is something that we have to be also attended to because without relationships, it's hard to give resources. And it's even hard to give the teachings of the Catholic Church and the Bible to, to people. And, and so I, I asked one, uh, one of my friends, um, about a uh, parish I belong to, and we do a great job with church picnics. We do a great job with fish fries on Friday. And I said, what would you do to create a relationship with all these people that come to these events, and yet they, they're not affiliated with the church, they don't go on a regular basis to Mass? And he says, whatever you have to do, you have to create relationships, okay? So this is, this is the paradigm shift that we're making, okay? So... We have to reach out and make personal connections. And so, reaching young people, here are some considerations from the three sources I mentioned. So from the New Copernicans, uh, David Seal is challenging us to go beyond the millennial stereotypes. And that is delayed maturation, uh, low social capital, which means not very, you know, a kind of an aptitude with relationships and decrease religious affiliation. And this is uh, what he said. He said, respect where they are in their confused spiritual journey. If we would agree to simply walk with them, then an angry atheism or a prodigal status in college is not a foregone conclusion. And so one of the things I think, and this really challenged me because what stood out for me with the younger generations were their limitations. So he challenged me, as well as other people, to look beyond that and to see what are they bringing to the table that we can really build upon, okay? 
And these are the, the qualities that he talks about. And I would say that their gifts correct past imbalances. All right? Their pedagogy, their learning, uh, they prefer hand to heart to head. Whereas the generation I come from, Generation X, and perhaps the older generations, was just the opposite. It was starting with the head, moving to the heart, and then, if you had time, move to experiences. All right? And that's what the hand uh, represents here. I would say this is a better approach in some respects because the, the distance between the heart, from the heart to the head, is a lot shorter than the other way around. If you start off with information, uh, there's no guarantee that little Johnny or little Jane is going to come back after confirmation. Okay, but if you can, with 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 uh, a vision and a connection with the youth, capture their hearts and appeal to their longings, to their dreams, and even respond to their fears, I think we're going to get somewhere. Millennials also want authenticity and they want transparency, which means in my ministry, when I do adult confirmation, I'm telling them about my problems. On Saturday, my wife and I in Sturgeon Bay, we just did a, um, a marriage prep day, and most of them are millennial couples, some are Gen Z, that are, that are getting married, okay? The feedback that we get from them is that we love it when you tell stories. I notice with my own kids, that when I get into teaching mode and I get too caught up in definitions and concepts, they tend to tune out, all right? So millennials, they want to, before they hear about your views or about the church's teachings, they want to hear about your story. And I think a lot of us need to do just a little better job in, in working on that and really reflecting on how Jesus has changed our heart, how he's changed our life, what kind of difference he has made. And, and I just mentioned that they are more interested in stories and testimonies than in teachings. And so I think um, the biggest takeaway is that they remind us that rituals and rules don't work without relationships. And they were never meant to. Uh, our Lord in the, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, he says, listen, if you have a gift you want to offer to God at the altar and someone has something against you, go make that relationship right reconcile with that person and then come back and offer your gift to the Father. Okay? He's saying that both are important. It's not one or the other. And this is something that, um, that perishes if, I think if they want to survive in the next 10 years. They're going to have to make this paradigm shift of really focusing on um, relationships. So how did Jesus do it? One of the things I wanted to mention is that he was great with one-on-one -on -one relationships. He talked to Peter in privacy. He talked to Nicodemus, to the Samaritan woman, to the adulterous woman, to the rich man, and to, and to Zacchaeus. There was a lot of times in the gospel that he was talking one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that's going to be our bread and butter going forward. And studies will show this, the findings of which I'll show you in a few minutes. That one-on-one -on -one accompaniment, the one-on-one -on -one relationships, for instance, when a person comes to the parish, you know, I think more than attending an event, for them, it's going to be connecting with other people and having discipled Catholics invest in those relationships. Jesus also started off very early on saying to the apostles, I believe in you. Okay? With me, you can do all things. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You can do greater things even than me. And so he was really saying, I believe in you. There was this uh, director, the national director for Alpha for Youth has, has shared with me that to say to a young person, uh, I believe in you is the same thing as saying, I love you. Okay? So telling them that the sky is the limit, that you can achieve your dreams, to really depend on God for this, is something that really resonates with them. Um, he also entered into the world and he spoke their language. He, he entered and he connected with them as to where they were at. To the blind, he said, I am the light of the world. To the hungry, he said, I am the bread of life. 
to the thirsty, I am the living waters. And to the grieving, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. With the apostles, he met them at the Lake of Galilee, and he simply helped them to fish. He says, cast your net on the other side, and you get a big, um, a big catch. And so he used that language. He also helped with uh, calming storms. Um, and when he did that, he met them on their level. He, uh, he, got his, he got their attention. They were like, okay, this guy is really cool. I'm willing to work with him. So I think for us, we gotta ask the question, what is the, their fish? What do, we, what do we have to do in order to get their attention and to meet them where they are? Our Lord Jesus started at the Lake of Galilee, but over three years, he moved them up to Mount Tabor and to the upper room where he, he transformed them into different men, okay? I think we need to do that with um, millennials and Gen Z. What is their love language? <clears throat> and so I just wanna share with you some of my experiences with adult confirmation and a discipleship group I do with uh, those who are grieving at the Curia. So the adult confirmation that I have, I have about eight classes or eight sessions in the fall and 10 in the spring. And lo most of the people that come to receive the sacrament, they're not affiliated with the church. They are, they're not praying. They're not doing a lot of religious behaviors. They're not, you know, they're not going to church at all. They're not going to mass on a regular basis. Uh, when I ask them if they know the difference between the Old and New Testament, they, they don't know. So they're very much in the post-Christian world. And with regard to helping them find a confirmation name, you know, they have to find a saint's name, and they just have no idea how to do that. And I've been doing this for four years at the diocese. And I would say, into my second, going into my third year, I, I got stuck. I realized there was a divide between me and them. Um, I was using Alpha, and Alpha, as you, some of you might know, uh, is a, a series of videos, it's a course, that introduces people to Jesus Christ, okay? So some of the Alpha questions were, you know, uh, why did Jesus die? How do I have faith? And what about the church? I realized that they weren't um, asking those questions. Instead, the kind of questions they were asking is, why should I care? Does faith work? Who do I trust? How do I get rid of my anxiety? They want to know how to deal with the brokenness and the unforgiveness in their lives, the boundaries, and also the communications. I've been you know, working on investing in one-on-one -on -one relationships as well as a group conversation. And I asked them to, I asked, I asked this question recently of my young adults and I said, if there is one or two things you can prove about yourself or about your life, what would you ask Jesus to help you with? And invariably it's relationships, okay? Broken relationships that they're trying to navigate through. As one member of the, the Gen Z uh, generation said, they may not be interested right away in what the church teaches or what the Bible teaches, but they just might ask you, you know, what do you have that I don't have? And this is to say, I've, I've come to appreciate over the last couple of years that the most important program, the most important uh, instrument that God will use is you, okay? And he will use me the presence of God in us. And I have to say, they are starting to respond. So instead of starting off with those big faith-based questions, I've been talking about anxiety. I've been talking about broken relationships and communication. And for the first time, they're starting to take notes and I'm seeing some breakthrough. Okay, so another thing that I'm doing at the Curia, it's not really young adult-based, but it's just open to anybody who works at the diocese. Uh, as to who's grieving, okay? Because I met a lady that I work with and she lost her father and she lost her son within two days apart, all right? I, I asked her, I said, is there anything that we can do to help you? And she goes, I really don't need professional counseling or professional uh, support group, but I, I do need 
somewhere where I can just uh, talk about my grief because I'm really suffering. So I, I responded to her and I said, I'll see what I can do. And so I got together um, a group of, of people that were actively grieving, about 14. And I called it Glimpses of Heaven and Moments of Grief. And what I do is share near-death experiences, and I'm trying to give them the hope of, that they will see their loved ones again by showing these videos. But we're also working through the heavy lifting of grieving. And this was, so the first time that we did this was in Lent of 2019, just a few months ago. And what they wanted to do, I thought they wanted to discontinue it after Lent was over, but they wanted to keep going, okay? And I was really happy to hear that. And so we still meet um, every month. And this is something that parishes can do. One of the ladies who, um, who she confided to me and wrote me an email and she said, I wish my parish would have something like this. When my daughter committed suicide about 10 years ago, I desperately wanted a place to really, to, uh, to get the support I need, okay? And she goes, I just couldn't find it in a lot of parishes. What we come to find out is that there are support groups for this, but you know, it's kind of like a needle in a haystack and it's hard to, to find. So, so what about at your parish? What about, can you start a grieving support group? You don't have to be a professional or a group for divorcees. I realize that with people who have gone through divorce, it can be just as painful as grieving the loss of a loved one through death. Pornography is another issue. Unemployment. I've been unemployed before between jobs, and I wish I had a little support group to help me to, to find a job, and also to get that emotional and spiritual support that I need. Then we got new parents and, and newlyweds, all right? So these are some of the things that we can go back to our parish, pray about, and initiate, all right? So, so here are some key points about relationship building and the things that I'm finding that are really important. And when I first came to the diocese, some of these things were not on my radar, but I've really come to appreciate it. So, <clears throat> one is that relationships are the carriers of faith. If we do not have relationships with the people that are coming to church on Sundays or Saturday evenings or coming to certain events, we just won't have the influence, okay? And we won't know how, how to minister to them. Events and programs at your parish level is insufficient. Um, church affiliation and mass, I believe, mass attendance, will depend on personal connections. Today, people do not listen or study their way to the faith as much as they used to, all right? I think the media culture has expected us, not expected us, but has created the expectation to be heard. So if I wanna get my views out there, I can easily do so through Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. I also have a blog as well, and I can get my views on um, just as easily. And so we, we kind of have the expectation to want to give feedback. Even on your, at certain news agencies, they have you know, uh, some fields for commentary, okay? Uh, today, people talk their way to the faith uh, more than they do by listening. So that means that we have to do more listening ourselves at the parish, and even in our families with our own children. We have to create a safe place for this to happen. And they are asking different questions than we who go to church on a regular basis are asking, all right? Some of us are asking, is it a sin to go to mass or not? Uh, what happens after we die? They're not asking those faith-based questions in a lot of respects, even though they do feel the God hole in their heart. Okay, again, they're wondering how to get through the day, how to manage all this homework, and how to cope with stress. If we can help them to live life, to cope with stress, and to do a, um, to hear about their dreams and their fears, uh, this is gonna go a long way. I have to say, um, Mr. Mothy, for instance, uh, took personal time out of his schedule to help my daughter, who was 17, to work on her ACT, you know? So she was, she was kind of struggling in the math department, and he did that several times, taking his own time out of a busy schedule, you know, to, to help her just to do that. 
And I can tell you that that was gold for my daughter. She will never forget that, okay? I think we have to go out of our way and do those kind of things. With also, not just spiritual needs, but non-spiritual needs as well. <clears throat> Again, they're more interested in our story, and so I think we have to be good at giving, telling our story, the before and after of, of, of uh, when Jesus came into our lives. And we have to invest in them, invite them on the journey. Um, and that takes time, okay? <clears throat> Here's a, an illustration that I wanted to show, uh, and this is one of the, the last side, slides for this evening. And I thought this was useful. <clears throat> Um, when a priest comes to bless your house, I thought this was a good illustration of how conversion works, because some of us get confused a little bit, including myself. When a priest comes to, to bless your house, he just doesn't bless the house from the outside, or just walk through the door and bless the whole house. If he does it right, you know, he goes into each and every room with the family, and he blesses each room, okay? I thought this was a wonderful illustration of how Jesus not only knock, knocks on the front door of our heart, but he wants to be invited to, into every area of our life, all right? Uh, not just the one hour uh, on Sundays, but also our social life, our family life, even our sex life, our entertainment, everything. He wants to be invited to each and every room so he, that he can turn on the lights and that he can bless these, these, these parts, different parts of our lives so that we can live life to the full. And here are sometimes the confusing part, is that sometimes an active Catholic will allow Jesus in uh, on Sunday mornings. Maybe they're going to church faithfully, uh, and maybe they're saying the, ro uh, the rosary faithfully, but they might be struggling with alcoholism. And for one reason or another, they didn't let Jesus into that area of addiction. And then we have a lot of millennials and people in the Gen Z um, generation that maybe are not going to church right now, but maybe they're reading the Bible. Maybe they're searching in these different areas of their life. And I think in order for us to be successful at reaching them, we have to capitalize on those areas where they are seeking and answer the questions that they are asking, okay? And again, this, this requires um, a, a great deal of courage on our part. For a couple of years, I've been asking parishes, on Easter Sunday and at Christmas Mass, what are you doing to reach out to the people that are coming to you, the people that don't normally go to church, the people that are not practicing their faith? Maybe they go twice a year, and that's it. A lot of our parishes really struggle to even acknowledge the new people, okay, and to, to even know what to do with them. And so, but together, if we network and pray about it, you know, we can find ways to connect with them and get all of these lights on in the house. But we have to know where they're, you know, uh, different areas of their life. So, and the, the point here too is that conversion, is very often messy. Sometimes there's a couple steps forward, several steps back. And we have to just be patient, okay? And inviting the people on a, a long journey. And I don't know if you uh, knew this, but at the beginning of every Mass, there is a liturgical procession. And that liturgical procession represents our journey to heaven. Okay, and that is to say one of the reasons why the altar server is holding a cross and walking towards the sanctuary is to say this, for 2,000 years we've been doing this, and it's to say that Jesus Christ is not only our destiny, but he's also our companion, okay? He's there with us, we're never alone to, um, uh, to, to struggle our way with life. He's there to help us with both the joys and the difficulties. And before I close tonight, I just want to show you some extra slides here um, in closing. And this is from the Barna study. And they asked non-Christians and lapsed Christians, 18 and older, a lot of them are young adults, what positive experience did you have with evangelization? What was that experience like? And, and also, uh, 
how did it help you to take the next step in faith? The number one ranking method was casual one-on-one -on -one conversation, all right? Remember I told you that our, our culture has shifted from unorganized activities to almost exclusively everything is organized, okay? They really value um, the, uh, just the casual one-on-one -on -one conversations. That's the kind of feedback that I got from my adult confirmation candidates and also the, the, um, the couples that we mentored. Sometimes for our focus meetings with these uh, newlywed couples, we take them out for a beer. We want to get the relationship started. The second one was casual group conversations. And the third one was a person at the church. Towards the bottom is a person on the street. And I would say that's equivalent to, to lectures, okay? So this is what they're responding to, and this is their preference. And I think we have to be you know, uh, open to hearing them about this. Remember that young families or young people, they quietly walk away from our parishes. We want to get their feedback, okay? Because they don't want to make anybody mad. They don't want, they don't want to offend anybody. So what they usually do is just quietly stop coming. And they don't tell anybody why they're not coming anymore. Here's another important finding, is that <clears throat> what do you desire in other people with uh, conversations on faith? The ideal versus the reality, okay? One is listening without judgment, okay? That's the 62% the you see there is the ideal. What they find in Christians, okay, is the reality, according to them, all right? So you can see a gap between 62% and 34% saying, this is what I'm actually discovering among practicing Christians. The other one is uh, not forcing con uh, conclusions. This is one of the hardest things for me as a Catholic, a traditional Catholic, because I put a high premium on orthodoxy and on the purity of doctrine. And so when they're saying things, they're not theologically accurate. One thing that I have learned to appreciate is that fraternal correction presupposes fraternal love. We have to have a relationship with them before we start kind of, you know, correcting them, so to speak. We want to lead them into fullness of truth, but we have to earn the right to be heard, okay? This is what Alpha does in part with uh, its training, with its courses. And the third, I'm not going to uh, go over the whole thing, is allow others to draw their own conclusions, okay? So, and this is what our Lord did. He rarely answered a question with a direct answer. Out of 180 times, I think he did it twice or three times. He usually answered a question with a question or he um, communicated the truth in mystery, that is, in a parable. He wanted to get them to search, all right? And so he did that successfully. If we go with ready-made answers, and correct the people, especially uh, high schoolers and young adults, all right, and not give them, allow, uh, not give them the, the opportunity to work through their doubts, to work through their skepticism, then I'm afraid we're shortchanging the process, and that's why I think a lot of people resist the faith formation process as it, as it exists today. And we're trying to work on that. Uh, faith formation participation has gone down by 57%, in the last 10 years. And so we really have to change gears, and I think we have to do it soon. And the last slide um, with these studies is this, and I wanted me to share this with you. Uh, it's the generational differences on faith sharing. Here you have a contrast between the millennials and Gen Z, the boomers, and the elders. And one of the things I wanted to point out is actually above that era is I am gifted at sharing my faith with other people, okay? Strongly agree or somewhat agree. The good news is that millennials um, rank themselves as 73%, which is an improvement with previous generations. So that, that, that's, a good, that's a good thing. Um, however, here's something that I, I found revealing. It is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith, okay? 40%, 47% agree that it is wrong, all right? So there's, there's a little conflict and tension in that faith sharing paradigm there. 
And lastly, if someone disagrees with you, it means that they are judging you. 40% as opposed to 11% with the elders, okay? And so this is something that we've noticed, a trend that we've noticed in faith formation and in our ministry. And it kind of requires a different approach when it comes to trying to transmit the faith, all right? So the four basic takeaways from everything that I shared with you is this. Discipleship goes at the speed of relationships. Conversion and spiritual growth can be messy. Linking Jesus to personal needs, questions, and concerns is really effective. I have found this to be the case not only with young adults, but with adults. And pray for your parish, get involved, and don't give up, okay? And the last thing I want to share with you, the most important thing, is that the presence of Jesus in you and your presence to them will be the reason why they come to faith. The last quote from New Copernicans, and it says this, it's a sobering one, for some it will take an impending institutional collapse before they will attend to the warnings that could have helped avoid much of the living crisis, losing the future generations that are crucial for the church's survival. And so um, hopefully with God's grace, with each other's support, we can reach the next generation and make that paradigm shift that is so necessary. And that is all I have. Thank you.